Chelsea here on the phone with Carl Kennedy. How are you doing today? I am doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. So, of course, the latest news with you is the new album from The Rods, Rattle the Cage, just released in January on Massacre Records. Awesome, heavy rock album. I feel like it's a nod to the classics in a modern sort of way. So talk to me about how you guys first got into making a new album for The Rods. Well, we've been recording periodically. And our last album, Brotherhood of Metal, was, you know, it took a while for us to do this. And we started this process about two years ago. And it took maybe a year to write, but, um, you know, it's been, it took two years actually to get it released. There's always all those pieces of the, uh, the puzzle they have to fall into place. But, uh, but, you know, we had gone, we wanted to do another album. We started and now we've been on a roll. We have a new bass player. COVID of course, you know, took its toll on a lot of people. And, uh, so we have a new bass player and it's just been a huge, it's a new day for the rods sonically, musically, um, and that's why this album is as different as it is. I think it's being being hailed as basically a throwback to our first album, or the best album since our first album. And I contribute a lot of that to our guitarist David. Um, his songwriting has kind of turned the corner, and of course we all contribute. But you know he's been handling the bulk of the music and doing a great job. And Freddie coming in with his bass sound, which is different than we've had, is a very Black Sabbath, the Geezer Butler kind of deep bass with the high, bright top end. And of course, Chris Collier, the famous mix engineer, has been doing projects for us and for me personally um, for a number of years now. And he's been the secret weapon. He knows what we need to sound like. And he delivered it on this album. Awesome results. And yeah, I agree with the the bass tone is definitely kind of new for the rods. Um, I did notice that the bass stands out, but especially being a three piece kind of setup, the instruments have a good balance, which is really cool to make you guys each stand out individually while still fitting together as an awesome unit. Yeah, absolutely. And that's as simple as that sounds, you know, although only three instruments, it's not easy to get each instrument to sound, have its own place sonically and, you know, stand out on its own. And of course, for me, being the drummer, you know, all I care about is the drums being as loud as they possibly can. That's all <laughs> I care about. So you just make the drums loud. And then if they're loud, then it's good. No, I'm kidding. I know, right? And drums got to take over the whole track. What, what is the track without drums, man? Of course. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, we have a we have a saying in the Raws, and it's tongue-in-cheek, and we always laugh about it. But, it, but it, to a certain extent, it, it is, to a certain point, it's true. And that is that if it's more than three chords, it takes longer than five minutes to learn. It's not a good rod song. That's kind of been a uh, three-piece band. Things have to be powerful. And uh, if you're trying to do a lot of intricate, delicate things, it really doesn't translate live, you know? The fans aren't going to stand there and watch you noodle unless you really have an incredibly great song, like a Stairway to Heaven kind of song, <laughs> where they know that there's a huge hit. Otherwise, they don't want to see you noodling around. They want you to come in and, you know, knock it out of the park right away. So that's what we try to keep it, keep that in mind, try to keep the fans in mind when we, when we write material. Now that's a great approach to songwriting. And yes, it's it's different when there's kind of a multi-guitar band kind of set up where everybody has room and space to kind of, you know, step up and solo and you're going to have the rhythm to support when each instrument kind of is standing out. That is the point. It's standing out. So you need to make sure that it's impactful uh, for the, the time that you guys are playing. So I agree with that. That's that's a great yeah, approach. Exactly. Now, even though you are known as a producer primarily as well, you actually didn't produce this record like you mentioned with Chris. So how is it for you when you take on that full musician only kind of role do you still find yourself thinking about things from a producer point of view always i think once once you reach that i've had musicians that i've worked with in other projects and they always say well carl here's things we don't hear and i think once you have those producer ears you're constantly dissecting and listening and i'm always into arranging so that's probably been one of my strong points and on this album we you know we co-produce this and of course i had my fingers in the pot even to the mix and end of things so you know we all we work together as a team david's great and freddie is great and so we all work together on this and we hear something we speak up and otherwise we stay out of the way and that's that's been one of the things i think is working has worked for david and, and myself we've been together 45 years and you know basically we follow the lead follow or get out of the way that's worked for us Definitely. You have a, a solid enough system that just kind of intuitive by that point, I'd assume. 
It is. I think we've, had, you know, we can look at each other. We work on things. We, we, we're instinctive, you know, after all these years of working together. And, you know, we've never, re- we've never really, we've had tense moments. Um, and I don't know why, because I am the Chelsea, to say that I am the sweetest, kindest, most easygoing guy. There's, I'm never intense, or, you know, but despite that, we've had a couple of tense moments. So we've never had an argument. And I'm kidding when I say that. And we've never had an argument. We've never had a shouting match or anything. 45 years, we've never had anything like that. We have had moments where we had to really work things out. Sometimes it gets a little emotional, but not, no raised voices, nothing, you know, you're a jerk, or I know, you know nobody gets punched. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but no, that that says a lot about you guys and how you work together and also just why you've stuck together for this long. I think there's a mutual respect and, and I think that's uh, what's carried us through. So also on the topic of producing, what first drew you to producing? Did you start out from the musician side? Were drums your first instrument and then you kind of moved into producing from there? What pulled you into the studio side? You know, drums were my first instrument, but almost within a month or two of playing drums, I had a guitar. So when I couldn't play drums, because you can only play drums so many hours a day before people will just come and, and uh, burn your house down. So I would pick up the guitar and I'd play the rest of the night. And, uh, you know, that's what I would do. P- noodle on the piano and practice guitar all the time as well as drums. So then I would start to write songs. And I think in those early years, I would probably say I wrote 50 of the worst songs ever written on guitar and uh, when i say the worst i have notebooks full of the most trite pathetic lyrics along with the simplest chords you could possibly put to those trite lyrics but i was always drawn to arranging songs and i remember one of my girlfriends was at elmira college and she could take out a model tape recorder and one of her friends took one out so I was able to bounce them back and forth, these horrible songs I wrote. And I would play the guitar one, and then I would play another guitar part, and I would sing, and I would bounce them back. So we'd let the recorder play through that little speaker, and then it would record to the other little speaker, and it was so bad. So probably after I did some overdubs, it was basically hiss and a horrible song underneath the hiss. But I was into it from day one, and when we got to the studio for the first Rods album, uh, you know, David and I had nobody there. It was just the two of us. So when he was working on vocals and guitar parts, I helped. And uh, vice versa when I was doing drum tracks and just progressed from there. That's always awesome. Into it, always loved it. And uh, I'm really, and I love producing. In fact, the last thing I produced by an outside artist was uh, Adam and the Metal Hawks. Last year I did a Christmas song for them. It was a great, great session. Great, talented band. If you haven't heard of them, Adam and the Metal Hawks are fantastic. And uh, so I still love it. It's just economically, it's not feasible anymore. And in terms of time, it's no longer feasible. It takes a big commitment to do a project. And if you know, not having a major label budget, it's very tough to take weeks of your time at all. Definitely. Yeah, that's something that's kind of occurring with the technology of producing as well. A lot of people taking things on the DIY route and everything and a lot less money going into major studios and studio time as well when a lot of people are kind of figuring out how to do things on their own, recording their own home setups and everything. It's it's definitely shifted the kind of landscape of producing and recording and just the way that looks now as opposed to even five or ten years ago. It's already changed so much. And it's funny you say that because I just finished a drum track for someone in Dubai. Wow. <laughs> said, hey, do you do, do, do drum tracks for people? And I said, sure. Let me hear it. If I think you can play it, do, do it justice, I'm happy to do it. So I did it. I got paid. It was fun. And, uh, you know, so it was. it's easier. I did it across, you know, it was in Dubai. We had to communicate because of the time difference. So, we, you know, it was tough to communicate sometimes because it was kind of upside down time. But whatever. It was fun to do. But anymore, it is a case of we record remotely. But with that with the Metal Hawks, we recorded live. And the vocals, so if you listen to their Christmas song, not Run Run Rudolph, but uh, Christmas Time, I'm trying to think, I can't think of the title. But uh, they were really talented, and they did all their vocals live around a microphone. I just balanced them around a large diaphragm microphone. But it was fun because normally I don't get to record in the studio with a band. 
normally it's all remote. Exactly. Yeah, Adam and the Metal Hawks is a great band. They performed at the Metal Hall of Fame last year, actually, and I, I caught them. They have that authentic rock and roll kind of sound going on, so they're great to see in the modern rock landscape as well. They kind of nod to the classics a lot, too. But, yeah, that's the thing about the producing and studio time kind of looking different these days. It is mostly remote. 2020 had a lot to do with that, of course, but it's it has its pros and cons, you know, because... It, it's there's a lot less bands going for the live and jam vibe of recording but you get to work on extremely unique projects like recording something for someone halfway or all the way across the world you know those are opportunities that it also offers as well so it's like just That's kind right. of they using never, as much of the advantages as you can they never existed before and i and also think that as drummers now i think we we uh like i know for me i've learned to play on behind and ahead of the click track so I can actually do a play on the beat for certain parts, but push it a little bit in the chorus, lay back in the verse, um, all within the context of being correct on time on the click track, but give it breathe, let the, the song sound like it's basically an old school approach to it. And that, that's important. And David and I have worked so well together at Shredding Night, with, I call us the Thunder Twins, the bass player and I, we lock in so well together. So we're able to really accomplish remotely what you would think we would be able to do in the studio and of course what we do live and that was that was really important to get that boss on the rattle the cage a live feeling and when i send my drum tracks i do what's called a zeroed wave it starts at the beginning and it ends at the end of the song and i try to play my tracks straight through i don't do i'll do three chorus takes and i'll punch this and i'll pace this i don't do that i'm like here you go if there's something that is off or you want me to change, I'll change the whole thing. Don't mess with my tracks because today so many things are beat detective and put on the grid and, and move to the point where like someone said to me one day, how can you, how can you tell who's a good drummer anymore? Because it's all triggered and moved around. So who knows what they played or didn't play. And my feeling is if you're going to do that to my drum tracks, tell me and I'll just program. It. I won't, I won't even waste my time pro playing and I'll program. No, it's good you're keeping the integrity of, of the live feel because that is what happens when you're playing a live show. You Things do push forward a little bit, pull back a little bit throughout even just one song and it's not going to be exactly robotically on the beat every single time. It's the humanity that's of right. it. And that's that pulse that you really you react to. You know, That's the that visceral thing that hits you and you're like, okay, if you're reacting to that, that pulse of that music as opposed to just so metronomic, which I love that stuff too. I mean, believe me, I love, I love the whole cut and paste approach. You know, I love that too. The place for everything. Exactly, yeah. It's just taking, you know, the, the positives and the advantages of all the, the different angles of it because it is a different landscape, but there's a lot of good that can come out of it as well. Yeah, so I've worked too hard to develop my own style to sort of just throw it away and just say, yeah, just... You know, we trigger and move things around and whatever. I mean, why, why bother playing if that's the case? <laughs> right. So you mentioned Rattle the Cage, the track as well. I mean, it is the name of the album, but that is a great standout track. It's also the latest single and video that we've seen from The Rods. So can you tell us a little more about what went into that track specifically? You know, David has been writing the last two albums. I wrote one of the songs. Uh, 1982, I wrote all the music and and lyrics and so on for that song but the brotherhood of metal i sent him the lyrics for and he came up with a killer track and on this so he's been writing songs he's been turning the corner as a songwriter and focusing more on vocals and more on lyric content as well as you know guitar playing just keeps improving his songwriting so i had this idea for you know sometimes you just have to rattle the cage people are pissed you know bottom line if you i'm sure people we've all noticed it people are angry and uh, sometimes with with reason and sometimes just because they're jerks. But bottom line is, there's a lot of anger out there. And so that's I had these lyrics about rattle, sometimes you have to rattle the cage, just have to rattle the cage. And so I sent them to David, and he turned it into this killer tune. And uh, it just seems like people really can relate to the fact that what the, what the lyrics are in the song, he set it up perfectly. And uh, so that's how that came about. But uh, you know, it's one of my favorite tracks on the album. It seems like everybody can relate to it. 
For sure. No, it's a great track to be the title track and just kind of define the album because the sound is very strong. And of course, the music video has a very live presence to it. So it fits in really nicely. And then Play It Loud is another awesome track, which is definitely a standout single, very rock anthem vibe. So any thoughts to share on that one? I had asked David to, you know, because I said ideas, I had asked him to write a song that was basically a call and response within the song. Not where you have to stop and you know, really put your hands together, but a call and response within the song. And uh, that's what he came back with. And, you know, it was pretty amazing. And uh, quite honestly, I have to ask him because he may not have, that may not have been the direct result of what I mentioned to him, but it came back right after I mentioned it to him. So I will confirm that before I say that's actual fact. Right. <laughs> well, it worked <laughs> out in any case. <laughs> yeah, no, but he, he really. It's a great song, and it's you know it has that uh, call and response thing built in, and it's just a cool, a cool track. And for David, that's the story of his life. Play it loud. <laughs> Definitely. About him people say, you know, when we play, we play clubs together. The guitar is so loud, can you turn it down? And I, I would always say, look, give him an acoustic guitar. You'll still be up here asking him to turn it down. That's great. So, which is the track that you said you wrote for this one? I, if the one I wrote was 1982, but that was on Brotherhood of Metal. Oh, okay, got you. So this was mainly Rod and Dave so in this Dave case wrote, for this one? All the music. Freddie contributed some riffs that we jammed on. Helen on Water, Helen on Water, and uh, you know. But actually, didn't, for this, I didn't even pick up my guitar. Now I have, so we're three quarters of the way through the new album. and uh, So maybe I'll have something to contribute because I am sending ideas from the recording. But uh, well, this album, not. David just wrote, kept cranking out and called me every day or two. I've got a new one. I have a new one. So either as a musician or as a producer, have you come to find any go-to gear that you always stick with for any project? Well, are we talking about drums? Are we talking about outboard gear? So either way, just anything that kind of sticks with you that you're like, I cannot do a performance or recording without this particular thing. And is there anything like that for you? Or do you like to switch it up with your gear? Well, for me live now, I have... A 101 from Sweden's signature snare drum. And that, that's been the drum that has been, I play live. Other musicians, when they use my drum kit, they've said to me, well, we'll use my snare drum. And I said, well, you're welcome to try mine. And did it a couple of times. And they go nuts when they hear it. They're like, oh my God, we'll play with this one. It's a great, it's so well made. It's such a fantastic sounding drum that uh, I love it. And uh, so I that's all I use it for all of my live gigs because it's such a great drum. And of course, recording as well. And the other thing is I have a Ludwig hand hammer tube lug snare drum, Black Beauty, which, you know, being a poor kid growing up and then just, you never see them because they're very expensive. But I finally bought one for myself last year for this album. And that snare drum is God to me for recording. It's the sound that I've been looking for. And uh, I'm thrilled with it, so I'm reluctant to change it out to record. I do, depending on the song, but for the most part, my, my Black Beauty snare drum from Lovely is the go-to for me now. It's great that you kind of have that, things that you settle into and feel comfortable with that are a part of your sound, but, you know, it's not necessarily that the gear defines your sound, but it's something that you can use to bring out your own sound in that sense. It is. It's nice to have that instrument that, will deliver what you're, you're hearing in your head because that's it's difficult. It's tough to get it to approximate what you're hearing in your head. It's always the, the sound you're chasing. Definitely, you know, especially, I mean, either as a musician or a producer, I feel like that's the perspective. You, It's hard to get it out into words sometimes. You're like, I know what this is supposed to sound like and I'll know it when I hear it, but I, I can't tell you how to find it. <laughs> I remember I was producing the uh, Heavier Than Thou album and Craig Gruber was playing bass. And Craig came in, and Craig Gruber played on the uh, played with Black Sabbath until Geezer came back. But he played with Gary Moore. He played with Oz. He played with the Rods. He played with Elf. He played with a lot of a lot of bands and uh, phenomenal bass player. But we're in the studio, and apparently he didn't really understand the sounds. First time I worked with him in the studio that way. There had only been live prior to, and so I go, Craig, what are you looking for in the sound? And he goes, Just turn the knobs. I'll, I'll know when I hear it. <laughs> it's not exactly the scientific approach but you know we'll, we'll work with it and uh, it's like some musicians will tell you well, i want to sound like that sounds like too much oranges but i want more apples what the hell does that mean 
So you have to, so you're trying to decipher these things, the, the code words that musicians use when they don't really know how to dial in the sound. But today there's so many amp modeling devices, and you know musicians are a little more savvy and aware of it. Uh, it's always a challenge in the studio to get that sound you're looking for that works for the the uh, player and works for the overall project. It's always a delicate balance. Definitely, but that's part of the the art and the skill of producing, and that's why although there's a lot of people you know trying to do it and trying to learn it at home, there's the ones who make a career of it, and then there's the ones who keep it kind of casual on the side. I think the distinction is that being able to listen, having that art of listening, and being able to produce the sound as you want it and as somebody else wants it is you know really the the skill that comes into play when you're producing. It does. There's so many there's so many aspects of producing including being a therapist. You know, you have to kind of get in people's minds and what they're trying to do, and you're trying to understand their goal, and you want to help them reach the goal that you don't want. Sometimes artists will shoot themselves in the foot without realizing it. So you have to walk that line where you have to uh, let them know. And everybody comes to things in their own time. So you may realize that they are not quite there, and they need a little more time. So you buy them that time as best you can while they're figuring it out so they come to it on their own. Because sometimes you've been really hurt. Psyches, you know, are delicate, especially uh, guys. You know, we are working with a female artist. They're like totally cool. They don't, you know, there's no big ego involved. But with guys, you got to really watch because they get it very. You would think they would be the opposite. You would think they would be really tough, but they're very sensitive, and so to walk a delicate line sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, well, a lot of people are very sensitive when it comes to their music, especially if it's something that they've written from scratch themselves, lyrics and music and everything. It's It becomes a very personal project at that point. So I'm sure, you know, it can be hard to get someone else's input in it. Like, you want somebody else's input to, to help you construct the sound you want. But at the same time, you're like, that's your project, that's your baby, in a sense. So it can be tricky from both sides. It really is. And you get demo-itis. You know, that's the other thing you have to combat, that people have heard their demo so long a certain way and maybe the snare drum's really loud and now they get to like oh the snare drum's not loud enough and like right but the mix works as is and the snare drum doesn't need to be that loud and they're just like it doesn't sound right to me and you have to let them have some time to adjust but yeah that's so true people come to with their own preconceived ideas of what it should sound like and when it doesn't sound like that um even if it sounds better Okay. They still have a hard time with testing. It's great, though. I mean, you've got an excellent track record as a producer, so you've clearly gotten the art of it down pat, and you've got the musician side of things going with the Rods and tons of other projects going on. So it's great to see new music coming from you and the Rods and everything you've got going on. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Can we uh, wrap this up with you telling me what's on the horizon for you in terms of projects right now? Chelsea, thank you for asking that. I have uh, been working with three quarters of the way through the new Rods album, believe it or not. And uh, as I said, David's been really prolific and we've all really been working on that. So we're really moving along on that. I have a new Kennedy album, solo album, that I have seven songs recorded. I have a new book, Tales of a Wild Dog, which will be released very soon. And uh, so, you know, and we have a bunch of things happening, and we have some dates. We'll be in Sweden July 6th at Time to Rock Festival, and we're just finalizing dates in Australia. And we have some regional dates here with Jim Florentine. We're doing a date for, with him on the 20th of April. So, a bunch of things going, and uh, you can always reach us at therods.com or Paul Kennedy on Facebook. I have several pages and you can just find me and easy to contact or the official rods fan page on facebook awesome great stuff well it sounds like there's so much going on for you so we'll keep an eye out for everything your book your new albums and best of luck on tour with your upcoming dates so thanks again for taking the time to talk with me thank you chelsea appreciate it very much